Hey guys, Leah here and welcome to City Church Online. We are so glad you're here. If it's your first time watching, thanks for joining us. If you're streaming with us live, feel free to play along. If you're joining us after the broadcast, you can always skip ahead for direct access to Sunday Online. Join in on the conversation, catch up with some of your friends, or make some new ones. Let's find out what's one nice thing that someone has done for you during the season. through social media right now and share this on your page and make sure to tag us at City Church on Facebook and Instagram at Love Hope City. getting our blood pumping. Today I'm going to show you a jab cross or some may know it as the old one two. So we're going to be jabbing with our left, crossing with our right. You ready? Here we go. Round one. Fight. Yeah.
We've loved seeing how everyone's been making their whipped coffee this week. Find out how to make another one of Pastor Cazelle's easy morning favorites, avocado toast. Good morning. Today we are going to learn about one of my morning favorites, avocado toast. Seven simple ingredients. Bread, avocado, lemon, egg, basil, everything but the bagel seasoning, and olive oil. Medium heat. Get that bread toasted. Chop up that basil. Slice up that avocado. Put it all on. Cover that egg for an even cook. Slice up some lemon, squeeze a little bit on top, grab your cooked egg, toss it on that piece of toast, and top it off with the everything but the bagel seasoning. Simple, easy, delicious. Enjoy! Love y'all! Grab your Bible and a cup of coffee or tea and get ready to worship and hear a great word from Pastor Kyle. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to City Church. Welcome to City Church Online. Welcome to City Church Online. We're glad you're here. guys, Pastor Kyle here. Welcome to City Church Online. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today. The first thing that we always like to ask you to do is to fill out a worship response. Grab your phone right now and go to lovehopecity.com forward slash response. Fill that thing out in its entirety. Check any boxes that might be relevant. And especially if you'd like to get connected into an online small group, we would love to see you get plugged in during this phase of church right now. We're all scattered, but we can still stay connected by the grace and power of God. And so go ahead and fill that out. And also there's at the bottom section there, there's a section for prayer requests. I would love to pray for you. Our team would love to lift you up before the Lord and know what's going on in your life. And while you do that, we are going to transition to our time of offering. And we just want to thank you for your continued support, even in these extremely challenging times. And if you're watching this and you've been blessed by the ministry in some way, uh, we would like to ask you to consider getting involved in the process of trusting God with your finances. 
You can give to City Church in one of three simple ways. First off, you can give through any web-enabled mobile device by going to lovehopecity.com slash give. Secondly, you can give via the Church Center app that I mentioned a minute ago, and it is the simplest and easiest way to give. You can schedule to give one time or do so on a repeated basis, however you want to do it. And finally, if it's easier for you to do it through the snail mail, you can do it that way too by mailing a letter to City Church, P.O. Box 587, Anaheim, California, 92815. We love you guys. We are grateful for your continued financial support. Enjoy the rest of the service.
This one name carries unimaginable weight, both then and now. This one name is mentioned in the Gospels more than any other name except Jesus. This person speaks more than anyone except the Lord. And Jesus doesn't speak to anyone else as much as he speaks to this guy. I'm talking about Peter. Peter who confessed Jesus as the Christ and was told by God that his confession would be the foundation of the church. And it would be. Peter, who tried to rebuke the Lord right after his amazing confession and then was told to get behind me, Satan. Peter, who walks in the water only to quickly succumb to the wind and the waves. Peter, who sticks with Jesus when others start walking away and then tells Jesus this amazing statement, where else would we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Peter, who misses the point of the entire transfiguration story, wanting to build a tent for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus instead. Peter, who cuts off Malchus the soldier's ear, trying to wage a physical war for Jesus. Peter, who swears he'd never deny the Lord, only to do so publicly three times. Peter, who gets a private appearance from Jesus after the resurrection. Peter, who Jesus publicly restores on the beach, and Peter, who should have gotten it after all of these things happening, but Peter, whose humanity just continues to appear throughout the pages of the post-resurrection scriptures. In fact, later, Paul would have to confront Peter to his face for acting like a hypocrite. 
The Apostle Peter who pens scripture and is revered for his heart for God but also for his humanity and for his honesty. When I see Peter, I see a picture of grace. When I see Peter, I see hope. And you want to know why? Because we've all blown it and we all continue to do so. And God never gives up on Peter just like God never gives up on us. So when early church leaders opened their first century mailbox to find a letter with his name on it, you'd better believe they all read it. Open up a Bible, either on your phone or a physical Bible, to the book of 1 Peter. We finished the Gospel of John and we took a little month detour or so, focusing on coping with COVID-19 and the new reality that we're all living in. And I felt that now was the perfect time to focus on something new. We're going to go through 1st and 2nd Peter together as a church in this new series. And there is so much in these two small letters about believers pressing on and enduring in spite of uncertainty, anxiety, and suffering. And in light of everything that we're going through today, I think it's pretty relatable. You know, Peter's letter wasn't written to any specific church. It was written to a bunch of churches in the region. But most likely, it was written to all Christians for all time. And in a way that only God can, he takes these ancient words and shows how current they still are in 2020. So let's pray and then we'll read 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2. Lord God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for how you continue to use it in our lives. And we pray that you would do so again right here and right now. Open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear. And open our hearts that we would respond and become the disciples you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. In the first verse, you see that this letter was written by Peter to churches dispersed in the region. And the old King James Bible adds the word pilgrims instead of the dispersed Christian term or exiled chosen ones. And though it's probably not the best translation, I love the concept of the word pilgrim because a pilgrim is somebody who's just traveling through. It's someone who knows that wherever they currently are isn't their final destination. And it's such a great metaphor for Christians on planet Earth. See, we're here, but we're really just passing through. We're chosen by God for a greater destination, eternity. And most other Bible translators use the word elect or chosen ones instead of pilgrims. And then in verse two, it starts off mentioning this phrase, according to the foreknowledge of the Father. And this right here is where you can get into some super nerdy Bible stuff about whether God picked us for salvation based off what he knew our choices would be, or whether he picked us just because he picked us based off his own reasons. And I believe, honestly, that you can make a solid biblical argument either way. So I'll go ahead and I'll give you my theologically profound and thought through answer that should solve this issue for you once and for all. Now, if you've been around City Church for a while, go ahead and say it out loud in your house. I have no idea which one it is. I don't know if God picked us based off the fact that he knew we would choose him or whether God just picked us to pick us. Maybe it's some weird blend of the two that we'll only fully understand in heaven. Here's what I know. God chose me and that makes me happy. God chose you and that makes me happy. God didn't have to choose to love us. He wanted to. And because we're chosen by God, there's some expectations that come along with that. And so in the next part of verse 2, it mentions those expectations saying that believers have been set apart for the sanctification of the Spirit and for obedience. Those are two fancy Bible words that simply mean doing what God says more and more every day. So this letter starts out from Peter reminding every Christian who might potentially ever read this letter that they are chosen by God. They didn't earn it. They don't deserve it. It's a free gift. And because they're chosen pilgrims, there's this expectation upon Christians called obedience that leads to sanctification or spiritual growth. And one of the biggest evidences of spiritual growth in every believer's life is the multiplication of grace and peace. The Apostle Peter's statement that his primary desire is to see grace and peace multiplied in every believer's life is where I'm getting my message title from today. My message title is, May Grace and Peace Be Multiplied in You. This statement 
was his desire for every Christian who would ever read these words. And I think it's a fitting affirmation for us today. You know, this desire of Peter's takes me to the first affirmation that I'd love for you to jot down if you're taking notes at home right now. And here's the first thing you can write down. I decide what gets multiplied. See, the principle is that I don't have to allow the negative events that are outside of me, that are beyond my control, to get multiplied inside of me. In this day and age, I sense the multiplication of a lot of other things than grace and peace. I see the multiplication of stress. I see the multiplication of anxiety. I see the multiplication of depression. I see the multiplication of fear. I see the multiplication of financial uncertainty. I see the multiplication of questions we don't have answers to. I see the multiplication of disagreements as to how to move forward in these times that we're living in. And when I say that I see these things multiplying, I'm not just talking about in the world in general or amongst people who don't believe in the Lord. I see these things being multiplied in Christians. I'll admit, it's a daily battle for me to stay in a place of grace and peace. As a guy whose negatives get so vividly seen in scripture, Peter tells us in his introduction that those things are always gonna be around us, but that those are not the things that God wants multiplied in us. God wants something else multiplied inside the chosen believer's life, and those two things are grace and peace. So how do we get to a place where grace and peace are being multiplied inside of us? Well, I think the first key is to remind ourselves of the truth that I decide what gets multiplied. It's in my control. So say it out loud in your house right now. I decide what gets multiplied. Now, come on, I know none of you really meant that. I know we're all new to this whole online church thing, but look at your roommate, your mom, your dad, your wife, and everybody say it out loud together. I decide what gets multiplied. There are lots of negative realities around you that are beyond your control. That is a fact. This virus is multiplying. The problems that stem from it financially and physically are multiplying. Those facts are 100% true. And we shouldn't live in denial about those things. We should be informed about them to the extent that we know what action steps we need to take for our families. But the issue is we can't do anything to change those things. What I want you and I to take hold of today is that those things can multiply around us, but the negative aspects of them don't have to multiply inside of us. I decide what gets multiplied inside of me. You decide what gets multiplied inside of you. You know, some of you might be sitting at home thinking that this kind of statement makes it sound like I'm saying people are in charge of their own destinies, and I'm not. Let's go back to the text and see what Peter said. Peter says we're chosen by God who picked us out undeservingly so that grace and peace could be multiplied inside of us. That is supernatural. That isn't something you and I can do on our own. That's something that God's Spirit enables every believer to do by His power. See, God has enabled every believer to have grace and peace multiplied on the inside, but God has also given believers the choice to take hold of it daily in simple, practical ways. So here's an example. Instead of reading that sixth news article on the progress of the coronavirus vaccine, which by the way is still a year out, ouch. <laughs> Instead of doing what I often do, which is searching the internet to see if some other country is getting to the vaccine quicker and then plotting how I could plan a trip to get there, hashtag true story, I actually have done that in my own head. <laughs> Instead of doing that, why don't you read the Bible? Why don't you read the great stories of the Bible of how God's people were passed over because they had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts? Why don't you read the story of Daniel who was thrown into a fiery furnace and into a hungry lion's den and came out unscathed? Why don't you read about David who looked at Goliath's size, but he told that giant that he was facing how big his God was. Why don't you read about Esther who God raised up for such a time as this to save the Jewish people. Why don't you read 2 Chronicles 7.14 where God says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Why don't you read about Jesus as he went to the cross, even though it was the last thing he wanted to do, but he knew it was his mission all along. Why don't you read about Jesus conquering death forever, this resurrection that we just celebrated on Easter Sunday a couple weeks ago. Why don't you read about the Lord commissioning the disciples to carry on the torch of building the church. Why don't you read about the spread of the early church. Why don't you read Paul's letters of encouragement and admonishment. 
Why don't you read about Paul talking about his thorn in the flesh, this situation that he repeatedly prays about and asks God to take away that God never does take away. And so instead, he just has to continue to trust the Lord in spite of it. I don't know if you can tell what I'm doing here or not, but what I'm trying to show you is how to take control back of what's multiplying in your mind. It's not rocket science. It's simple. Peter wants every believer to know that the purpose of this letter from the very introduction is to see grace and peace multiplied in believers' lives. Because of what God has done, I get to decide what gets multiplied inside of me. And you get to decide what gets multiplied inside of you. Now let's read 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The next affirmation I'd like you to jot down is this, God is my guard and whatever gets through his gates has his go ahead and will turn out for my good. The text that we just read clearly states that believers are guarded because of their faith. In both the New Living Translation and the New International Version translations of the Bible, they use the word until. And let me read the New Living Translation version. It says this, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So let me explain this to you just a little bit. Salvation is the great hope of the Christian life. Amen? Peter reminds us that we're all going to see that salvation physically on the last day of our lives when we pass from earth's shores into eternity or when the Lord returns for those who are alive to see that day. And that part is totally awesome. That's the part in the worship song where everybody cheers and claps and it's it's a great reality. It's what we're all looking forward to at the end of our lives. But what Peter is saying here in this text is that God is actually actively protecting us because of our faith until that day. In other words, believers are being guarded and protected by God right here and right now. And I don't know about you, But that brings me so much comfort to know that God is actively protecting me. So what does that mean precisely? I don't know entirely. I know that it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen to people who love God because we live in a fallen world and there's consequences because of that. And yet I also know that God is actively protecting Christians from things that we don't even know about. The fact is this, it's in the scripture and I will take it to the bank. I love this visual metaphor of God being our guard. If we were all in the church room together, I would ask you this question with a show of hands. How many of you have ever been clubbing? And then I would raise my hand and I would tell you I've actually never been. I'm raising my hand as an example to get you to do it. And then I'd be like, okay, good. Now we know who to pray for in the church. Okay, kidding. I wouldn't say that. Actually, I probably would. Y'all know me well. Uh, And then I would say, invite me to the club next time. Okay, kidding again. All right, where am I going with this? Pastor Kyle needs to get back on track. For reals though, I would not go with you because my idea of a club is in bed by 8.15, 8.30 at the latest and asleep by 9 p.m. Amen. Okay, back on topic. At the club, there's a bouncer or a guard at the door, right? And the bouncer's job is to keep everyone out that isn't supposed to get in. They have a list and there's a dude with an earpiece probably somewhere. And these bouncers are usually these big burly dudes that you would not want to be caught in a back alley with and definitely that you wouldn't want to get into a brawl with. And somewhere inside, the boss is communicating through the earpiece, telling the guard, who can get in and who can't get in. Here's the point of this strange illustration. God is both the guard and the boss of your life. And God decides what comes in. God protects you from things coming in that you don't even know about. God takes things away even that he knows aren't gonna be good for you in the long term. But, here's the big but. If God lets something tough inside the gates of your life, he didn't let you down. He gave it the go ahead. You know, in the age-old story of Job, we see that God actually allowed Satan in this one unique instance to get past the gates of Job's life and wreak havoc for a season. It's a crazy story, 
Now, I also think it's not a normative practice of Jesus to let Satan in like that. And I don't think we as Christians should go around thinking that Satan's always after us. You know, I would say in most cases, it's really our own sin and the effects of the fallen world that cause us to go down the wrong path. But still, we see that there is precedent for God the guard letting hardship into believers' lives for his own purposes. So what are those purposes? Sometimes we get a glimpse of them on this side of heaven. Sometimes we don't. In another story we see in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, how Jesus was literally led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness specifically to be tempted by Satan. Now there's also a strong sense in which this is a unique story to Jesus's ministry, just like with Job. I don't think it's a one-to-one that we would have in the same way. But the Spirit clearly led the Lord there with the go-ahead from the Father. Jesus never succumbs to the temptation and triumphs over the enemy. Here's the point of these two little Bible illustrations I just shared real quickly. More often than not, God the guard blocks bad things that we never ever know about. He's looking after us. But in those instances, I would argue like the pandemic that we're all facing right now, where God lets the hardship happen, God is still our guard. And we have to trust that whatever gets through his gates has his go ahead and will ultimately turn out for our good. A few weeks ago, I was texting with a doctor friend of mine and we were just chit chatting about how he's feeling and uh, what he thinks about this coronavirus, how long he thinks it's gonna go, all that stuff that we're all doing when we're talking to people. And his reply was one of the best answers that I have heard about this entire coronavirus situation. He said this, he said, and I quote, I feel confident that God is in control and I'll get it. (laughs) And when I first read it, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, he is confident that he's gonna get the coronavirus. That's a scary, scary thought. And then I thought, wait a minute, he's a dedicated medical servant who's placing his life on the line like so many others out there right now. But the part that struck me is that he affirmed both the control of God and the reality that he is likely to get this virus given his exposure to it. Guys, here's where I'm going. God is our guard, he's in control, and if this virus is given the go ahead to go into our body's immune system, that ultimately was his will for our lives. And how we fare from it is also in his hands. You know, doctors can do some things, thank the Lord, but we as believers must ultimately entrust our lives into the hands of God. At the same time that I say that God is our guard, let me also remind all of us of the scripture that tells us, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. My translation, don't be stupid. Don't go running around Costco unnecessarily. Don't be hanging around people just because you think you're invincible. You are not invincible. God is your guard, but it is highly presumptuous to think that he will guard you from your own stupidity repeatedly. Sometimes God will protect us from our own stupidity, but let's not go making that our life protection strategy, okay? God is my guard, and whatever gets through his gates has his go-ahead and is for my good. Now let's read verses 6 and 7. It says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, Peter makes it clear that sometimes trials are necessary for a while. Peter also makes it clear that they can deeply grieve us, even as believers who love God. But I love what Peter says at the start. He says, in this you rejoice. The New Living Translation translates it this way. It says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure trials for a little while. Here's the next affirmation I have for you. I can be truly glad in my current trial, even if it goes on for a while. You know, a trial is a test that only lasts for a little while. I love how the New Living Translation uses that phrase, to be truly glad. How many of you know that you can pretend to be glad about something when you're really not? We've all been there. (laughs) We've all had to put on a happy face during certain situations. And there are occasions, in my opinion, when fake it till you make it is actually a good practice in terms of finding happiness. For me, I'd rather pretend to be happy and ultimately wind up believing it than wind up walking around constantly sad and never move forward. 
You could disagree with me, that's okay, but that's just how I feel about it, that's my opinion. There are other times in life when you feel truly happy and it just oozes out of your soul naturally. Well, what Peter is implying is that for the believer, we can be truly glad and rejoicing even in the midst of a trial like the one we're facing right now. We don't have to be fake glad right now in this pandemic. We can be truly glad. We shouldn't even have to fake it until we make it. The issue is more this. The issue is how do we process our emotions when we're going through trials? I love that Peter acknowledges the grief. And so here are a few thoughts that I have on how to get back to a place of gladness in a trial. My first thought is this, never dismiss or deny your own trials or those of others. You know, if you just constantly shove it down or you tell other people, don't panic, don't worry, you're overreacting, that's probably just you not wanting to deal with someone else's emotions or your own. And honestly, that kind of talk rarely leads to helping others. Secondly, instead, acknowledge, affirm, and identify with them. Say something like this instead. Say, you know, that's really heavy. I'm really sorry that you have to be going through that right now. I imagine you must be feeling anxious and uncertain about the future. I'm here for you. I haven't been through what you're going through, but I know that when I'm hurting, I need support. And if you would allow me to be, I'd like to be a support to you right now. Thirdly, allow yourself to feel grieved. Right now, we are all collectively grieving the loss of normalcy in our lives. Some of us are actually grieving the loss of loved ones as well. Some of us are grieving other losses that we're going through right now that aren't necessarily connected to the coronavirus, but it's all entangled together somehow. Some of the losses that we're talking about and dealing with are significant while others are less so. But we're all in a massive state of grief right now that we haven't even begun to process, we need to let ourselves feel that sense of grief or it will rear its head in ugly ways in our lives. So allow yourself to feel grieved right now. And finally, give the situation to God. We should be genuine and acknowledge the pain of our current situation while also actively working to get ourselves in a better place. And now here's the part where I'm gonna start preaching a little bit. If you aren't actively working to get yourself in a better place, here's what you're doing. You're allowing yourself to be stuck where you are. And you know, giving a situation to God doesn't mean just praying about it and hoping that it all gets better. That's the first step. But in my experience, when I pray about something, God tells me to do something. So when we give a situation to God, we're letting Him turn it into gold in our lives. And when gold is made, it gets heated to very high temperatures so the impurities can rise to the top and be scraped off so that the product that you get at the end is pure gold. Well, that's what God does with trials in our lives. Things heat up, they get hard, but in His hands, the impurities of our lives rise to the top so they can get scraped off and the rest of us can get turned to solid gold. Give this current virus and all the negatives that come with this pandemic to God and let Him turn it to gold in your life. City Church friends, we can be truly glad in this current trial, even if it goes on for a while. It is not an easy time for any of us, but God is still our guard and God has allowed this situation through the gates of our lives and yet we can rest in the fact that whatever he lets through the gates has his go ahead and is going to be worked together for our good. And lastly, we decide what gets multiplied inside of us. And Peter says the thing that believers should replicate and multiply inside themselves more than anything else are grace and peace from God. May grace and peace be multiplied in you. Amen. And if you're watching this, and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, and you would be someone who I'd call a window shopper of God, the Bible, Jesus, and the claims of Christianity, I believe unmistakably that God brought you to this video to answer the question of whether you'd go to heaven when you pass away. And so if you have been thinking about these things, I want to tell you God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of your sin. He promises to adopt you into His family. He promises to fill you with His Holy Spirit. And finally, He offers you an eternal life that's beyond anything that you could ask for, dream, or imagine. And so 
if you are ready to step over the line and become a Jesus follower, it isn't mystical, it isn't magical, God hears the faith in your heart, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now in the comfort of your home or wherever you're watching this. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
as you go today, the Apostle Peter gives us these words, may grace and peace be multiplied in you. And it came from a guy who seems to have had a lot of anxiety, who seems to have had a lot of issues controlling his own behavior at times and gets it right and gets it wrong. I don't know if that sounds like you, but sometimes it sure does feel like me. And yet in the midst of that, he says, grace and peace can be multiplied in the believer's life. That's my prayer for you, that the grace and peace of Jesus would be multiplied in you this week. See you guys next time. Have a great week, guys. Bye.